Wall Street Wrap-Up is supported by Bamboulas, featuring live music. And now, tapas and wine upstairs. Bamboulas, the heartbeat of Frenchman Street. This week on Wall Street Wrap-Up, Houthi rebels have been targeting cargo vessels in the Red Sea, and shipping is being diverted to longer and more costly measures. Today, it's the official start of the so-called Santa Claus Rally. So will this extend through next January and the first week of January? And next year is a presidential year. So what does 2024 look like when there is a presidential race? We'll tell you. And why are so many investors now investing in ETFs, exchange-traded funds? Investing has been exploding. So tonight, we're going to be talking with Tim Urbanowitz. Tim is the head of investments and research at Innovator Capital, an ETF company. And what is the most popular stock of 2023? More investors have bought this one stock in the S&P than any other. That stock is, you know, I think I'll tell you later in the show. So stick around for the next 28 minutes. This is Wall Street Wrap-Up. Hi and welcome. I'm Andre Laborde. Well, with just two days left before Christmas, but who's counting, right? Today starts what's known as the Santa Claus Rally. And it's been tracked back to 1950, where it starts with the last five trading days of the year. And that would have started today, plus the first two days of trading into January. It occurs just over 80% of the time. And last time it did not happen, though, was in 2018. Now, it, it generally is the best seven consecutive days of the whole year, generally. We're also in a seasonal pattern where the best six months of the trading year are November through April. And narrowing it down even further, three of those good months are November through January. Also, as we've mentioned on the show before, the last quarter of the pre-election year, going on right now, usually ends stronger. Now, some may wonder why are December through January usually very good for the markets? Well, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, we had George Ball on our show. He, George is former CEO and chairman of Prudential Beach Securities, and he was also CEO of EF Hutton. And as he said that many investors are selling their stock losses for tax purposes, plus new money is coming in normally in January. And finally, Many on Wall Street, plus other businesses as well, the employees are getting end-of-the-year bonuses that add to the markets. Now, we've talked about 2023, but what does 2024 look like? And 2024, it is an election year. You didn't need me to tell you that. And in election years, when there is a sitting president who is running, which is what is, is happening, the S&P 500 has not declined and has averaged a 12.2 annual gain in re-election years. But curiously, though, when there is no incumbent running, it's down 1.5%. Add to that, the Federal Reserve is looking to pivot from their raising or pausing of interest rates and start lowering, which makes the stock market always very happy. According to a recent CNBC poll this week on Biden's handling of the economy, it doesn't look good. As James Carville, who used to work in the Clinton administration one time, said, it's the economy, stupid. 64% of registered voters disapprove of his handling of the economy, while 31% approve. And his handling of foreign policy isn't much better. 63% disapprove, with 29% of those registered voters approving of his job performance. Well, it was the longest weekly winning streak for the S&P 500 since 2017. For the week, the pops were technology, communication services, and staples. And the drops were, well, just discretionary. Nike had its worst day, though, in 26 years. The Dow Jones ended the week up. The utilities did post a weekly loss. And most S&P 500 sectors were up both for the day and also for the week. This week, the Dow Jones closed today up two-tenths of a percent. The S&P 500 closed the week up seven-tenths of a percent. And the Nasdaq closed for the week up 1.2 percent. Morgan Stanley this week raised Netflix's price target to $550 per share, an increase of 13 percent from today's closing price. Morgan Stanley said they see a continued growth from the online streaming service. 
Netflix is up almost 76% from the beginning of the year. Houthi rebels are taking over cargo ships traveling through the Red Sea, causing shipping companies to divert from the Red Sea a normal passage through other, more longer areas. Cargo shipping rates are soaring because cargo shipping are being diverted through other routes. An example, if a container coming from Shanghai to the UK used to cost about $1,900 just last week, well, today that same container will be costing $10,000. And this week, an article appeared in the Wall Street Journal that said that there are more American households today that own stocks than at any time ever before. Well, stocks may be individually owned, but they also could be mutual funds and also ETFs. So tonight, we're going to be talking with Tim Urbanowitz. Tim is the head of investing and research at Innovator Capital, who specializes in ETFs. Hi, Tim. Welcome to Wall Street Wrap-Up. Great to see you, Andre. Tim this is Christmas time. Let's say you're at a Christmas party and someone says, Tim, what's the difference between a mutual fund and an ETF? What do you tell them? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And Andre, the way I like to think about this is think about the mutual fund and ETF is simply the wrapper. And it's really what is underneath the wrapper that's going to drive your returns and your risk over time. But think of the ETF itself as, as really a, a newer technology that comes with a, a lot of sleek benefits that you don't necessarily always have in the mutual fund wrapper. Unlike a mutual fund, the ETF wrapper itself trades on exchange. So as an investor, you're able to go out at any point in the day when the market is open and go buy shares of that particular ETF like you would any other stock or exchange traded instrument. So you have this added layer of liquidity where you can get in and out at any point that the mutual fund doesn't necessarily offer. With the mutual fund, you're able to do that at the end of the trading day at net asset value. So you have that, that on exchange liquidity that is a little bit different. You also have uh, what we consider to be tax efficiency or really a, a little bit better opportunity to control when you pay taxes with the ETF wrapper. It's very rare that you will see a capital gain distribution with the ETF wrapper. So there's different uh, you know, opportunities that you have to harvest losses inside of the strategy, which makes the vehicle a little bit more tax efficient than the mutual fund itself. And you know, Andre, I think the, the, the last piece that's also very important with the ETF, you also have transparency in knowing exactly what you hold at any given point in time. You know, unlike a mutual fund where you don't necessarily know all of the stocks and bonds or what other, other instruments you might hold underneath the hood, with the ETF, you're always going to know what is in that. You're going to know, hey, I own Apple, IBM, Microsoft, all of these companies, you'll be able to see the holdings and weightings at any point in time. Is there, Tim, any specific amount of stocks, number of stocks that you can have in an ETF? And, and here's what I'm thinking of right now. Uh, let's say we talk a lot about the Magnificent Seven. That's really been big in the last six months or so of the seven engine stocks of the S&P 500. Um, it, are there a minimum amount of stocks in an, any ETF? There are not, Andre. And, and you see just a wide range from some ETFs that hold thousands of stocks underneath the hood to other ETFs that actually only hold one individual stock. And you know, in a lot of instances now, it's not even stocks or bonds. There's other instruments you know, our firm at Innovator, we specialize in options-based strategies. So you can have options that are underneath that wrapper uh, of the ETF itself. So you can do, you can have options as, as well uh, that you, can you specify, I would like to have it at such and such strike price for expiration at, at such a date like this Friday or at the end of this month or six months? You, you can, and, it, and it's very powerful. And I, I think this is why you're seeing just the wave of growth that we have into ETFs as, as a whole. The market has grown just tremendously over the last decade, continues to, to, to pick up investor dollars. And more recently, Andre, we've seen an explosion in assets in options-based ETFs. And you're, you're really, you know, part of what we do at Innovator is we are actually using the ETF technology to our advantage. So I'll give you one example uh, of a strategy. Uh, the, the symbol on this or the ticker on this strategy is TJUL. 
And what we have is we have a package of options underneath the hood of this strategy, put options and call options on the S&P 500 ETF. And what this strategy does is over a two-year period, it gives investors 100% downside protection against losses. So the market goes down anywhere from zero to 100%, you have protection. And then on the other side, we're providing upside exposure to a cap of 16.6%. And very simply, what that means is if the market goes up anywhere from zero to 16.6% over the next two years, we're going to capitalize, we're going to capture that return. And anything beyond that 16.6% return, that's what we're going to be giving up. Uh, so that that's really the advantage. So a lot of investors are using strategies like this to help manage risk and manage return in their portfolios. These are uh, just, it's much simpler for a an investor to go out there and just buy an ETF like they would a stock, understanding that the options package is being professionally managed. So this particular ETF, it, like I said, it's a, there's a 16% cap and it's based on the S&P 500. So let's say it's over a two year period. So you theoretically could be making 8% a year, 16%, because you're, you're capped at that, but at the same time, you're you're covered on your downside as well, too? That, 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 that's exactly right. And we, we've seen a lot of um, financial advisors, institutions, and retail investors that are using it really as a way to get cash off the sidelines. Mm -hmm. you, you see the return of, of the equity market. Over the long run, we know that the, the stock market or equities have a lot higher return potential than cash and money market and CDs and things of that nature. But there also is a hurdle that people don't want to lose their money. Uh, and so a strategy like this is a way to, you're not going to get the full upside exposure, mm -hmm. uh, but you're going to get more potential than you would in some of these cash and cash-like instruments, while still knowing that 100% of your capital is, is, is being protected. Right now, I talked about the, the Magnificent Seven, as they talk about. Is there an ETF that if a person wants to, let's say, instead of buying all seven stocks of those seven uh, in the S&P 500, is there an ETF that captures those seven? That, that's a good question, Andre. I know over the years there have been subsets of that, as those that Magnificent Seven, the, the, the FANG stocks, as that has changed, there have been offshoots of ETFs that try to capture you know, parts of that or those 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 new categories. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure, to be honest with you, if there's one that is, is out there that just focuses on the, the Magnificent Seven. But if there isn't right now, my guess is there's there's probably an issuer out there that's that's looking at it and thinking about it because clearly those are stocks and exposure that investors want. What about the fees? Um, you know, we, I, just, I started off talking about a mutual fund as compared to an ETF. Well, with a, a portfolio manager of a mutual fund, I'm sure there's turnover. Uh, and I would assume there's turnover in this as well, too. But what about fees as compared to a mutual fund as compared to a, an ETF? Yeah, that's another great question, Andre. And, and on average, ETF fees are, are known to be lower. Um, you know, there's a lot less operational costs and hurdles that you have to deal with. So you typically see ETF fees that are, are much lower. I'll give you an example of that TJUL strategy that I talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, that expense ratio is 0.79% for the year, so 0.79%. Uh, and there's there's other strategies. If you look at if you just want broad equity exposure, um, where you're just buying an index like the S and P 500 or the Nasdaq 100, yeah, you know, there's strategies that can give very cost effective uh, access to those strategies in, in the realm of you know as low as three basis points. What about cryptocurrency is really big right now, um, Bitcoin and Ether and other types, but are are there or is there about to be an ETF that would capture that type of an investment? It's it's quite possible. Uh, it has not been approved yet, but uh, mm -hmm. things are, are looking pretty good. And, and for investors that are wanting exposure via the ETF right now, there are futures-based strategies that are available. There are a number of different filings and registrations or, or that, 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 that are being are seeking approval right now. And it's anticipated that we'll see a decision on those in early January. So I know there's been a lot of buzz about it. 
uh, crypto, Bitcoin, Ether. These are clearly areas that uh, investors want exposure to. And as an ETF issue, we're looking for different ways to help add the, the benefits of the ETF wrapper to those asset classes. What about tech uh, for the remainder of this year, which we've just got a couple of more trading days, but also into 2024. You know, sometimes, Tim, a let's say a sector that is hot one year may not may be out the next or vice versa. You know, let's say a sector that is not in in vogue for one year is hot the, the next year. So right now, technology, the technology sector for 2023 has been on a tear. Do you what do you see technology for 2024? So th there's a couple things, and we just came out with our, our 2024 outlook. And one of the key points that we think is important to focus on in the new year is making sure that pockets of the market that you have exposure to are areas where the, the risks that we see out there, whether they be higher interest rates, recession risks, you name it, that those risks are appropriately being priced in to the equity market. So technology is one of those areas that have, have been on a tear, not to say that there couldn't be more upside exposure to be had there, but we also need to be aware that there's been a good run-up and you need to consider the starting point. Uh, valuations, how much people are paying for stocks matters. Um, so we, we need to think about that. What's our valuation? What's our starting point there? Um, and then, you know, what is the earnings potential over the long haul? And clearly tech has high earnings potential. But one of the things that we're looking at that asset class now and we're thinking is it's probably time to start really protecting some of the gains that we've seen here recently. So um, one of the strategies that we are talking a lot about uh, are uh, buffered ETFs on the QQQ, so on the NASDAQ 100. Um, one of the most popular strategies there, uh, NJAN is the symbol, provides a 15% buffer against losses on the downside. Um, while also subsequently providing upside exposure to a cap. And, you know, those, that most recent cap was right around 20, a little over 20%. So it's just a trade-off, but we need to be thinking about how do we really protect a lot of those gains that we've seen while still maintaining exposure if you continue to see tech stocks run. Well, so far for the for the month of November and now into December, uh, stock market overall, all three indexes that have been on a tear, even the Dow Jones has been hitting new highs. Uh, do you think pr stocks right now are overpriced? And if for a person that had, because there's a lot of cash on the sidelines, uh, like something like $6 trillion or $5 trillion rather, that has just been sitting in money markets and such, is it too late to get in right now? Uh, are they, are stocks overpriced or do you think there's still time that's a, that's a, that's a loaded question andre and i'll answer that <laughs> in, 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 in two parts uh the first it, it comes down to really um in the in the short run and really where we're at in the in this cycle and if you look over the last two years what's been the most important thing far and away has been this fed hike cycle where the fed has been increasing interest rates and if you look historically, uh, when the Fed pauses, when the Fed finishes its, its rate hike cycle, that has very consistently been a very profitable time to be in equities. When they hiked for the last time, looking at the, the returns of the S&P 500 index in the 12 months following that last hike, Equities return about 16 to 17% on average. And there's only been one instance, Andre, where we've seen returns dip negative. So it's typically a very profitable time. And by the way, the majority of those instances actually ended in a recession. So while there's, yes, those there's, there's clearly risks out there, uh, you, you, it's really important to be invested right now. We think we're right in the middle of that Fed pause rally and we could still have longer to go. Getting to the other piece of your question, when we look at, you know, is the market overvalued? Uh, we view this as what's really going to be important next year is, are we able to see interest rates come down slightly? If we're able to see interest rates come down, if the Fed is able to cut interest rates, uh, we, we see the market right now as, as, as fairly valued or even slightly undervalued. If rates stay at the level that they're at now or move higher, we would consider the market to be overvalued. 
Well, Tim, do you see that, let's say, and, and I would love to find out your thoughts of maybe of how, if, if they're going to cut and how many times they're going to cut for next year, for 2024. But if, like what you're saying, if let's say they don't cut as many times, are stocks so valued right now or so uh, priced in that if they don't cut those amount of times that they're being bought at such a level for December that we may see a pullback for, for next year? I, I think you could. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and the way we think about returns in the equity market, Andre, is, is there's really only three areas that you can source returns from mm -hmm. uh, on stocks. You can get your dividend, which the dividend yield on the S&P 500 is, is right around 1.6%. We know it's going to stay um, pretty close to in, in that range. So that's set in stone. Secondarily, we can get uh, what's coming from earnings growth. So are companies making profit? Are they growing their profit? That's another area we can get returns from. And the third area we can get returns from is, is valuation expanding or contracting, uh, meaning that our investors paying up more for that earnings stream than they were last year. This year, the market's up over 20%. All of that return has been driven by the third bucket, multiples expanding, valuations simply growing. Next year, we think the ec equity market can deliver a positive total return, but it's not going to be driven by that valuation expansion bucket. It's going to be driven by that middle bucket, and, and that, is, that is earnings growth. We still think the economy can grow. We still think earnings can grow. But also, you have to put that in context. Can the market do another 20, 30 percent next year? I would find that very difficult if we don't see valuations expanding. Um, so all in all, we would expect lower total returns than you, you saw this year in the new year. What about that next year, 2024, is an election year? Uh, does that have anything to play into how we're being perceived of uh, how 24 will be? You know, it really hasn't had much impact uh, historically. If you look at the S&P, the returns on the S&P 500, uh, they're typically below average in, in election mm -hmm. years. And I, I think part of that, Andre, is just people like certainty. Investors love certainty. And in election years, they don't have that. They don't know what tax policy is going to look like. They don't know what forward policy is going to look like. And all of these different issues will have impact on markets in, in the near, but we don't know what those will look like. So all in all, we've seen returns that have just been lower than, than average in the new year. And I think just given the starting point that we're at now, probably pretty consistent with, with what we'll see uh, in, in 2024. What about geopolitical risks, Tim? Um, you know, we think of, and we talk about black swans. Well, the whole purpose of a black swan is because we don't know what's going to go on. But, you know, I'm thinking of um, the Israeli war right now, with Hamas. Uh, we're talking about Russia with Ukraine. And right now, our shipping with uh, shipping cargo through the Red Sea with the Houthi rebels are now having problems that our the U.S. Navy has to be involved. Do you see any kind of geopolitical risk that may be escalating for, for next year? Yeah, yes, a a absolutely we do. And it's certainly something that, that you need to be aware of. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I always joke, it's funny, if you were to read the news headlines and, and see everything going on, you'd have no idea that the, that the market's up 20, 25% <laughs> this year. Right. Very uh, true. It, it doesn't seem to matter. But, right. but it is important to pay attention to. And you know those risks that you just mentioned there, uh, Andre, and specifically the, the new one with the Houthi rebels, uh, those are issues that, that can impact inflation. And a lot of the good news that we've seen driven uh, uh, from, on the inflation side over the last several months uh, has really a big component of this has been energy prices that have ticked lower. And the issues that you're seeing now where you have to have oil tankers uh, and cargo shipments reroute uh, and going around as opposed to going on a more direct route through, through the Red Sea, that's adding that's adding shipping time, that's adding shipping costs, which ultimately could have a, a more sustained impact on prices over the long haul. That has the ability to send energy prices higher. Uh, we've seen this movie before with, with conflicts in the Middle East where you've seen oil shocks and energy shocks across the board. Now, we haven't seen anything like that yet. Uh, for the most part, outside of these little smaller uh, attacks, the, the, the conflict has been contained, 
which is why you haven't seen such a big impact. In fact, energy prices outside of the last couple of days have, have been ticking down. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to ignore those risks. And I think the biggest risk there, um, outside of the human impact, obviously, is that you could see a, a, a tick up in energy prices, which would put upward pressure on inflation and ultimately get back to, you know, can we start to see interest rates get to a point where they can come down? Tim, I know with the explosion of ETFs in the last five years, really 10 years. Uh, that's a great way for investing. And we just only scratched the surface. I hope you come back. Yeah, absolutely. It's great to be with you, Andre. Thank you, Tim. Well, hey, if, if you have a question, maybe a comment about the show, we'd love to hear from you. Make it concise, make it piffy, and write us at Andre at benacapital.com. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now for a wrap up on Wall Street. If you owe back taxes, the IRS is giving you an incentive to pay up by waiving nearly $1 billion in late payment penalties. Now, there are over 4.5 million taxpayers that owe for the 2020 and 2021 tax years. So if you qualify, you get a special notice next month in January from the IRS. And finally, what is the most popular stock for the S&P 500? Well, for the first time in five years, more investors have bought this one company than ever before. Now, the five most, most popular stocks are coming in at number two is the Spider S&P ETF with the symbol SPY. Number three is Invesco's Triple Q's Trust and followed by Amazon, NVIDIA, and then Apple. But coming in as number one, according to Vanda Research, the most popular stock in 2023 was Tesla and ending the year as the most widely held stock name. And, well, that's a wrap up on Wall Street Wrap Up. Monday is Christmas and the markets are closed, but trading will resume on Tuesday through Friday. But coming up in January, we'll be talking with Professor Emeritus at Harvard Law School, Alan Dershowitz. He has represented every client from O.J. Simpson to Mike Tyson, Patty Hearst, Jeffrey Epstein, even Donald Trump. That's Alan Dershowitz coming up in just about two weeks from now. Our thanks to Tim from Innovator Capital for being with us tonight. But as always, we appreciate you for allowing us into your homes this evening. Have a fun weekend with the ones you love. Merry Christmas, happy holidays, and enjoy the season. Remember, if it's Friday, it's Wall Street Wrap-Up. I'm Andre Laborde. And also, always remember, money never sleeps. Good night. Wall Street Wrap-Up is supported by Bamboulas, featuring live music. And now, tapas and wine upstairs. Bamboulas, the heartbeat of Frenchman Street.